شاء الله يعني بتمنى انا ب 2024 اني بساء واحد واحد احلم اني اكون بحلم Well, this is the new year, Eve, and everyone's supposed to be happy, but we are not happy. We cannot be happy because our beloved somewhere under the ground at the Gaza Strip, and we want them home today, tonight, with us. As hundreds of families pray for the safe return of family members held hostage by Hamas, millions of people are praying for the fighting to stop. And now with Israel announcing it will begin withdrawing troops from Gaza, the question becomes, are we any closer to that happening? I'm Kate Snow in for Gotti Schwartz, and this is Stay Tuned Now. It appears to be the most notable public announcement of pulling Israeli troops back since the war with Hamas started, something the Biden administration has been pushing for. And while the move could signify the focus is shifting away from northern Gaza, where the Israeli military believes they're close to assuming full control, Israeli leaders continue to insist that the public should expect a long military campaign. Meanwhile, as that war rages on, Israel's Supreme Court struck down a law today that was supported by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. It was meant to limit the Supreme Court's power. The reason this is a big deal is because a lot of people in Israel see its Supreme Court as the only safeguard against government power. All this as tensions rise in the Red Sea, continuing to raise the specter of a wider war in the region. NBC News correspondent Jay Gray has more. Yeah, look, the situation in the Red Sea began with a distress call from a cargo ship there, U.S. Navy choppers responding. At that point, say they say they were fired on by Houthi rebels and returned that fire, sinking three ships, killing 10 men on board those ships. It's the first response we've seen from U.S. troops that have ended with a fatality. Uh, that certainly ramps up the situation, which has been escalating over the last month or so. Uh, U.S. troops have been fired on from uh, organizations in Yemen, in the Red Sea, and uh, surrounding areas. So a lot of concern there. While Israeli troops continue uh, to gather along the border with Lebanon, more troops moving in, more equipment, tanks, and, and other equipment there. And that's a continuous back and forth. So not only here in Israel, but globally, there is a big concern that this could ultimately become a, another front in this war. All of that while the ongoing war in Gaza continues with a lot of focus right now in the Han Yunus area. Uh, we know that it is a densely populated urban area. The fighting has been very intense. The IDF says that they believe Hamas leadership is hiding in that area. And so they're really focused on trying to find all of that while they continue with airstrikes as well. Uh, they do say that they've eliminated a lot of the command and control structures, a lot of the military facilities, including some of the missile launch sites, and they say that they are continuing to find and eliminate tunnels in that region as well. And what leadership here in Tel Aviv and military leaders on the ground in Gaza are saying is that this is a process that's going to continue months into the new year. That's the latest from here in Tel Aviv. I'm Jay Gray. Back to you. Tonight, two families in California dealing with a terrible tragedy. Police say a 10-year-old boy shot and killed another 10-year-old boy with his dad's gun. Families have identified the victim as Keith Frierson, known as KJ, to loved ones. It all happened in an apartment complex in Sacramento County on Saturday. Police say the boy grabbed the gun from his father's car and bragged about having it. Then, according to officers, used it to shoot the other boy. KJ's family now mourning his loss. 10 years old, no, he was only 10 years old, he was only 10 years old, 10 years old, <laughs> and he didn't deserve this, he still had a whole life to live. It's just awful. The alleged 10-year-old shooter now facing a charge of suspicion of murder. His dad is also facing charges in connection to the shooting. Let's bring in NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson. Steve, it's just heartbreaking, all of it. How did this happen? 
Awful to hear, awful to hear from the aunt. It happened, uh, according to police, as cut and dry as it possibly could. The dad was with his son. They were in a neighborhood where KJ was riding his bike, as you mentioned, around 4.30 Saturday afternoon or so. The dad tells his son, the dad is 53-year-old Arquette Davis, tells his 10-year-old son to get him some cigarettes. The, According to police, the boy goes into the car, and instead of grabbing the cigarettes, he grabs his dad's gun. He's got it. He's obviously bragging about having it. And then at some point, he shoots KJ. KJ is on the ground. He's bleeding from his head. He's bleeding from his neck. Paramedics and police in the sheriff's department are called. They perform CPR on KJ. They then rush him to an area hospital where he is pronounced dead. After the shooting, the 10-year-old boy, the alleged shooter, runs to a nearby apartment complex where he is then later found and detained and charged. Mm -hmm. His father, apparently, according to police, tries to dispose of the weapon by placing it in a nearby trash can. All of this, of course, under the investigation as both the father and the son are now in custody. Okay. And, and Steve, I just all I can think of is this is a 10 year old child. What does this process yeah. look like in California when you're charging a child with murder? So it's difficult. Of course, in, in Sacramento County, you have 48 hours to charge. There is no bail. There's no bond. There's nothing like that. The child is held until a determination is made. He can then be released to his family, released to uh, his parents, if possible. And then he is either charged or let go. Obviously, more enhancements may come. They may try him as an adult. All of that is later. Of course, it is more difficult to find information when you're talking about a minor. They're not releasing the child's name. But that is the standard operating procedure when there is one, when you're dealing, of course, with a 10-year-old boy. Okay. Yeah, and Steve, I understand that the father of the alleged 10-year-old shooter wasn't even supposed to have a gun. Is that right? So what charges is he facing? According to the Sheriff's Department, this is a convicted felon. The gun was reported stolen in 2017, which is separate from the father, who apparently was convicted of a crime, should not have had a weapon whatsoever. So he's already being charged with a, uh, being a suspicion of being in possession of a firearm by a felon, criminal storage of a firearm as well, carrying a stolen loaded firearm in a vehicle, child endangerment, acting as an accessory to the crime, after the fact because he's alleged of throwing that gun away. And then you saw the message from the sheriff up there. The sheriff has been very prolific about tweeting and putting the message out there about keeping and storing loaded firearms, especially around children or they're just having them in general. This will be 1,600, more than 1,670 incidents involving firearms that led to a child's death in 2023 alone. It is now more than motor vehicle accidents. Okay. Yeah. All right. Important reminders. Steve Patterson, thank you so much. New year, new laws. Today, a ban on carrying concealed firearms in most public places takes effect in California. It applies to a total of 26 places, including public parks, playgrounds, churches, and banks. But its path has been marked by legal challenges, and the future of the law is unclear. Just 10 days ago, a U.S. district judge tried to block the law from taking effect. But on Saturday, a federal appeals court put a temporary hold on that order. So now the law does stand for the moment. Let's bring and NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Danny, Happy New Year. So let's talk about the judge who tried to block this law from, from staying in place. And he said, quote, it was sweeping, repugnant to the Second Amendment and openly defiant of the Supreme Court. Talk about the legal issues at play here. Harsh language, but there's actually some really interesting analysis behind this in the district court's opinion. And it goes like this. This is about what's called sensitive spaces jurisprudence. There's a whole body of law on what are these sensitive spaces that you can say even a law-abiding, concealed carry permit-owning person, where can you even say to that lawful gun owner, Right. You can't go in there. And one example is a courthouse. A courthouse is a great example. You go to federal court, you've got to turn in your firearm pretty much no matter who you are unless you're law enforcement. And even then, I think you usually have to. Uh, so uh, what are the sensitive spaces? The Supreme Court in Bruin suggested that that is a very small list. California has created a very large list of these sensitive spaces. So the district court went into this historical analysis of basically what was intended at the time of the Second Amendment in terms of where you'd be able to bring in a firearm. And it gets into this great discussion of things like 
a place that serves liquor. And I can't help but think of the Wild West. Like, right. were it, was it the understood? Saloon. Is it movies or was it really understood that you would saunter into the, the saloon, kick that swinging door open right, right. and be a concealed carry owner? Or is that like a fiction that we've all sort of grown up on because of TV? And the court goes into this analysis, the district court, and concluded that most of these sensitive spaces are violative of the Constitution. But, you know, the challenge here is understanding that this injunctive stuff is really what we have is a pause by the appeals court yeah. on a pause by the district court. And it can get really confusing because we haven't even gotten to an adjudication on the merits. Right. So you have one court say, no, no, this law is no good. And then you had the other court say, well, on Saturday, let's just pause. Let's, one court let's says stop. The other court says stop the stop. Are there precedents in other states for a law like this? Or is California going a lot farther than anybody. Uh, you could argue that California is going farther than anybody, but we are really in sort of the early years of a post-Bruin set of jurisprudence. The Supreme Court has almost never taken up Second Amendment cases. You can really say, arguably, they've only taken it up twice, maybe another one or two times. You know, arguably, the courts have taken up the issue. So since Bruin was a very recently Bruin, decided the case, case in New York, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Since the case was only recently decided, you could say that, well, we don't have a lot of precedent to build on. And the district court's opinion relies heavily on that very recent Supreme Court case, which is going to be an interesting development as courts continue to try and analyze gun ownership and lawful gun ownership and where someone with a concealed carry permit can take their firearm. All right. So all the legalese aside, what happens next? Like what what happens for people who live in California? Yeah, at some point, well, for now, the uh, the the law will go into effect. It was not going to go into effect. Now right. it, will, it will, and that is until the court can decide the issue on the merits. When it has a full evidentiary hearing, the issue's briefed, and the issue is finally decided. There's really no final decision at this stage. If you want to play, you know, place your bets, you might say that, well, because the original district court made a finding that one side was likely to win, but look, the appeals court went the other way and said, well, maybe you can't pause the pause, or maybe we'll pause the pause while the uh, court works this out. Yeah, but bottom line right now, people with a concealed permit can't go a lot of places. The law goes into effect, and yes, as yeah. written, the law has those sensitive spaces in which even concealed carry ownership or carrying is not permitted. Danny Savalos, thanks so much. Tonight, we're learning more about the crisis at the border. In December, migrant crossings shattered all previous records, and that's left some mayors saying their cities are at a breaking point. NBC's George Solis has that story. Tonight, after weeks of scenes like this at the southern border, NBC News has learned December marked a record all-time high in crossings. Some 300,000 undocumented migrants crossing the border, according to DHS officials. It comes as more migrants arrive daily in already overwhelmed cities, by plane near Chicago, and by bus this morning in New Jersey, sent by Texas Governor Greg Abbott. It's a type of chaos that this governor is committed um, to, to, to administering. Local officials say sending the migrants to New Jersey is an attempt to sidestep New York City's new rules regulating arrivals of buses of migrants. This is not stopping people from coming but about ensuring the safety of migrants. This, as a battle over immigration policy, is brewing between Governor Abbott and the Biden administration. The Department of Justice threatening to sue Texas if it implements a controversial measure that would allow state and local authorities to arrest, jail, and prosecute migrants suspected of entering the U.S. illegally. Abbott says the Biden administration is refusing to enforce immigration laws, and Biden border policies are encouraging the migrant surge. Here in New York, many migrants end up at the Roosevelt Hotel, one of the many taxpayer-funded migrant shelters. Jose Echeverria from Venezuela has lived here for six months, telling me he's illegally selling coffee on the street, but with good reason. He says he's not just going to sit around and wait for a handout. He's going to sit here and work to provide for his family. The father of four saying he's doing whatever it takes to survive. The main thing these mayors are requesting is help from the federal government. Here in New York, Mayor Adams saying the city is reaching its breaking point with up to 4,000 migrants arriving each week. Kate. 
All right, George Solis, thanks so much for that. Don't go anywhere. We've got a lot more ahead. We're just getting started. Up next, it's no surprise after big holiday gatherings, people are getting sick. But it's not just COVID. Add in the flu and RSV. So how much worse are things going to get? Plus, deadly earthquakes rocking Japan, even triggering tsunami warnings. We'll show you the damage there. And no matter where you live, there are probably some new state laws in your state this year. We'll tell you about the ones that could end up affecting the people the most. That's all just ahead, so stay tuned. Welcome back. Here are some of the other headlines that we're watching tonight. Early this morning, police say a wrong way driver trying to escape from police hurt at least eight people after driving into a crowd in Midtown Manhattan. The cops say two people got into a fight and one of the men got into a car and then drove wrong way down 7th Avenue in New York City, hitting marked police cars and a food truck pinning a woman. The NYPD says officers ran after him and were eventually able to catch him. He was then taken to a hospital and is in critical condition. Two people were injured in a shooting at a Walmart in Michigan on New Year's Eve. Police say 10 rounds were fired after some kind of interaction between two suspects and someone they were targeting. That person was shot along with a woman who was a bystander, according to police. They're now looking for two suspects there. A plane carrying 350 migrants from Texas landed in Rockford, Illinois early Sunday, and the asylum seekers were then sent on buses to Chicago. The buses were chartered by Texas Governor. Greg Abbott. Sunday's flight was the second time in two weeks Abbott has chartered a private flight to send migrants to Chicago. And if you're playing Powerball, maybe you could start the year off on a really high note. The jackpot is an estimated $810 million. That is the fifth largest in the game's history. The estimated cash value for the drawing is $408.9 million, according to the lottery. But that's enough, isn't it? And in Connecticut, twins born within minutes of each other now have different birthdays and birth years. Dad and mom welcome their son, Seven Morris, at 11.59 p.m on New Year's Eve. And then his baby sister, Soli Morris, was born at 12.02 a.m. on January 1st. Both twins weighing in at six pounds, nine ounces. And the hospital says they're doing great. Some big babies there. The new year for many is off to a stuffy start. Cases of respiratory illnesses across the country are on the rise and could continue to climb after the holidays. The CDC reports a 16% increase in positive influenza cases, that's the flu, steadily climbing along with COVID and RSV cases. And take a look at this map. When you take a look across the whole country, more than half of the states are reporting high levels of flu activity. Those are the states in orange. And those 13 states in red are seeing what the CDC categorizes as very high levels of flu. Hospitals are seeing more patients, and that has some doctors concerned about meeting demand as emergency rooms fill up. NBC News medical contributor Dr. Vin Gupta joins me now. Dr. Gupta, happy, happy New Year to you. Thanks for being here. So we laid it all out there. Do we expect things to get worse? And, and how do people avoid getting sick right now? Okay, happy new year and, and, and thank you for having me. Uh, you know, things are getting worse. We do think RSV is plateauing, but to your point, these next four weeks are gonna be tough. We have flu is spiking in 60% of the country, specifically in the Southeast, very high levels. But critically, Kate, we're seeing hospital stress. Reminds us of 2021, 2022, the parts of the peaks of the pandemic, where the hospitals are getting stressed now, ERs, ICUs, even places like the Bay Area. So that's what we have to look out for. If you're traveling back critically, this is a really, difficult week when it comes to viral transmission. If you're traveling back home, protect yourself, wear a mask. It's not too late to get that booster shot. There are things we can do to, to, to avoid getting uh, any of these viruses. Yeah, just got my booster a couple weeks ago. Um, the CDC reporting shows a dramatic increase in ER visits as well at the end of the year for all three of these major respiratory illnesses. How are hospitals handling the spikes? Well, you know, some are moving towards mandatory masking. So that's one piece is that we often know hospitals can actually be quite dangerous when it comes to exposure to some of these viruses. So that's protecting staff, protecting patients is critical, but it's not a universal policy across the country. Uh, but we are, uh, many hospital systems are working with primary care outpatient facilities to make sure that there's enough testing to make sure that we can keep people home and, and that can be home so that we're sparing hospital capacity again to those that need to be there. Uh, for everybody out there, 
uh, there's a free service provided by the federal government. It's called test2treat.org. It's entirely free. If you don't have great health care access, you can get a free telehealth appointment and free care for COVID-19 flu with treatment if appropriate. So there's ways to stay at mm -hmm. home and not necessarily have to go to the hospital. What was it again? test to treat .org, .org. .treat.org. That's a really good tip because, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of folks don't have access to a doctor really quick and, they, and then they have to leave the house. So COVID, RSV, the flu, here's the big question. How do you tell the difference? How do you know what you have? That's such a critical question, Kate. I'm glad, I'm glad you, uh, you bring that up because a lot of patients come to me and say, well, gosh, should I get tested because I have flu-like symptoms? The answer is yes if you're medically high risk. Uh, for flu, though, classically, if you're just trying to figure it out based on your symptoms, high fevers, body aches, classic for flu, possible with COVID and RSV, but very classic with flu, especially over 103 with COVID, shortness of breath, uh, uh, fatigue, sore throat. Again, can be present with all three, but very hallmark of COVID-19. And then RSV, critically for all the parents out there, especially if you have a young infant at home, causes wheezing. So if you hear, if you have a baby at home, they're wheezing immediate uh, visit to your pediatrician to get seen. All right, such good information. Dr. Vin Gupta, stay healthy. Thank you so much. Thanks. And tonight, a warning about medical spas, known as med spas. Have you heard of this? It's a $15 billion business, but some of the treatments being offered could land you in the hospital. NBC News medical reporter Erica Edwards has that story. Jewish treatments that can help you look and feel better. Med spas are surging across the country. They're a $15 billion beauty and wellness business, offering treatments like IV hydration therapy with vitamins, advertised to boost energy and ease holiday hangovers, or injections to break down fat, tighten skin, and give a more youthful glow. But now federal regulators are once again warning that getting trendy medical treatments like these could be dangerous. Unfortunately, I did get this because I went to a spa here. Their warnings, social media influencer Bia Ama wishes she'd known before getting a mix of vitamin and fat burning shots at a California med spa back in 2021. How many shots did you get? I would say I was injected over 100 times. Walk me through what happened next. So within 24 hours, I began feeling very sick. As the days progressed, the injection sites turned into these hard little balls. According to her doctor, Bia got a massive infection caused by bacteria that can be associated with cosmetic procedures involving injections. We reached out to the owner of the med spa where Bia got the injections, but never heard back. Dr. Rashina Bissett McCain at Baylor says she's seeing more patients like Bia following what they thought were simple beauty procedures. One of the most common complications that we see typically is infection, um, usually at the site of the IV placement. But there are med spas that do other things, such as laser treatments where patients can come in with burns. While the American Med Spa Association says most facilities are safe, with no national regulations, oversight has become an issue. There are states who simply don't have the resources or the time to be looking at the medical spas and ensuring that they're doing things correctly. Well, this is at my nursing school graduation. Oh, I love this yes. one. That's my dad, Jen. And In July, Haley Hudson's stepmom, Jennifer Cleveland, passed out while getting a prescription strength electrolyte infusion at a Texas med spa. She was rushed to the hospital and died of sudden cardiac arrest. Just, she was so friendly, so opening, so warming. We just didn't have words as a family. You know, it was just, it was so sudden, so quick. While the autopsy report was inconclusive, the Texas Medical Board found the spa's medical director failed to properly supervise an unlicensed individual performing intravenous treatments, resulting in a patient's death, and it temporarily suspended his license. Attorneys for the spa say there is simply no criminal liability. Experts say if you plan to visit a med spa, always ask who owns and operates the med spa. Most states require a physician. What are the credentials and training of the person providing treatment? And is there a licensed medical practitioner on site in case of complications? Questions for an industry growing at lightning speed, now facing new concerns about patient safety. Erica Edwards, NBC News, Huntsville, Texas.
Such important reporting there coming up. Packed roads and airports for the past two weeks, and it isn't over yet. We have those details. But first, you got to see this. Some brave swimmers started 2024 by swimming from the island of Alcatraz all the way to San Francisco. It's a tradition for the South End Rowing Club. They cover the 1.2 mile distance and it is not easy. Swimmers have to qualify ahead of time to make sure they're physically fit. And the weather was in the 50s, people. Kind of makes polar plunge look like a breeze compared to that. But don't worry, they do have a champagne brunch afterward to warm up and celebrate. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. Here are some of the stories happening out west that we're following. A Colorado mother accused of killing two of her children was arrested in London over the weekend. Police say they believe 35-year-old Kimberly Singler faked a burglary at her Colorado home last month. Responding officers found a 9-year-old girl and a 7-year-old boy dead at the scene. Singler then disappeared a couple of days before Christmas. She made an appearance in a British court today and now faces extradition back to the U.S. A Surfer died after a shark attack in Hawaii. Local reports have identified him as 39-year-old Jason Carter. Police say he was surfing in Maui's Paia Bay on Saturday when the attack happened. Police also say first responders tried to save Carter after pulling him out of the water, but he didn't make it. Hawaii keeps track of shark incidents, and this was the eighth one of 2023, according to their data. And folks living in and around Los Angeles might have woken up to a shaky start on 2020 to 20. 24 because a 4.1 magnitude earthquake struck off the LA County coast this morning. Officials say the epicenter was about 16 miles southwest of downtown Long Beach. They also say there were no tsunami concerns and no one was hurt, thankfully. Millions of Americans are starting this new year with a pay bump. That's because the minimum wage is going up in half the states across the country, but that also means higher labor costs for employers and some businesses are already planning layoffs. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock has more. After years of fighting for a higher wage floor in cities across the country, the new year is going to bring a new paycheck for millions of Americans, with about half of all states and the District of Columbia either raising the minimum wage on January 1st or at some point during the year. Hawaii's increase will be the largest, while Washington will have the highest minimum wage of any state at more than $16 an hour. But it's California and fast food workers like Anisha Williams who are seeing the most seismic changes after years of struggles. I have to pick and choose um, between rent, groceries, um, and livelihood. Now, the Golden State's minimum wage jumps to $16 at the beginning of the year, and for fast food workers, it rises to 20 in April. The mother of six, Williams, says that is definite progress. We protested every which way to prove our point. But businesses are reacting, especially in California, where several Pizza Hut franchise owners will reportedly lay off more than a thousand drivers statewide and rely instead on companies like DoorDash. For mom and pop shops like Frankie's Pizza in Old Town Sacramento, the owner tells us the wage hike will mean longer hours for him. Are you saying you would hire more employees, but because of the rate hike, that is no longer an option? I cannot do it. I can't. Um, I mean, who's going to pay it? <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't be able to afford to do it. I have to uh, work longer hours to compensate for that. This new reality for many businesses, coming as 20 states still rely on the decades old federal minimum wage of 725 in place since 2009. While workers like Williams see new opportunities. So many people doubting us and Sometimes I can't even believe it, you know, and I'm just so, I'm so happy. Sam Brock, NBC News. Sam, thank you. The holiday travel rush is not over just yet. Millions are heading home tonight after what's been a record-breaking travel season. Today is one of the busiest days for air travel, with TSA projecting it would screen more than 2.5 million passengers, a number that TSA already surpassed last week when more than 2.6 million passengers were screened during the busiest days. That is a new high when you compare it to 2019's record travel season. And while we didn't see any major airline meltdowns like last year, it wasn't all smooth sailing either. NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa joins us with more. Emily? 
Hey there, Kate. Well, you know, you think about it. More than 115 million Americans traveled for the holiday, according to AAA. And now a lot of them are returning home, with today expected to be one of the busiest at airports. You look at some of the numbers from TSA in recent days, and they screened more than 2.6 million passengers on seven out of the 10 days surrounding the Christmas holiday. To put that number into perspective for you, we didn't even see that kind of traffic once during the same time period back in 2019. So we're talking before the pandemic. So there's just been a huge interest in travel this holiday season. Looking at some of the cancellations and delays today, according to Flight Aware, there's really only been a handful of flight cancellations. There's been more than 2,200 delays. Again, that's according to Flight Aware. And in New York, authorities have been urging people to arrive at airports to JFK and LaGuardia in particular, especially early because of pro-Palestinian protests that caused traffic in the area, leading to delays in reaching uh, the airports. This has an estimate. Estimated 100 million Americans hit the roads throughout the holiday season, sadly, with not without tragedy. We're learning from police in Queens, New York, of a very serious car crash. A car had struck a curb, flipped over, and then another car hit it, killing five people uh, involved in the crash, according to police. Meantime, back here at the airports, we're learning more about a 16-year-old who was flying by himself for his first time. He accidentally boarded the wrong flight just ahead of Christmas, and he landed in Puerto Rico instead of Cleveland. Tonight, we're learning from the family that Frontier Airlines has apologized for that. Here's more from the dad. Take a listen. I could feel the fear in the text message. Like my heart pretty much sank at that point because there was nothing I could do. I'm, I'm in Tampa. He's in Puerto Rico. He's scared. He doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know uh, where he's at. He's and Kate, looking ahead for the travel forecast, analysts say to expect 2024 to be even busier. Kate? Oh, is that right? All right, Emily Aketa, thank you. A special band made an appearance during today's Rose Parade. Members from Maui were marching just months after they survived this summer's deadly fires. <laughs> High school students from all over Hawaii, it was the experience of a lifetime marching in the Rose Parade. For some from Maui, it's been a long road to get here after surviving this summer's deadly fires. We met up with Hawaii's all-state marching band last week in California as they prepared for the big day. Siwa'i Laufo composed the band's music. <laughs> How excited are you about what's about to happen? I'm so excited because it's my uh, coming back to life uh, celebration. Back to life because this summer, Siwa'i nearly died of smoke inhalation when flames ripped through his neighborhood. This is right behind of our house. He ran back inside his house to save important items like his computer, which had all the band's music compositions. You saved the music and you then went on to direct this band and form the band again and get them to the Rose Parade. That is very meaningful to me. Parade organizers donated money for new instruments to help kids like Sheila Arcala, Danico Cabading, and Samantha Shibao, who lost everything in the fires. Even though I went through a lot, I'm still really grateful to be here and grateful to just everybody who supported me the whole way. In California, they made new friends and met other bands from around the world. The students from Hawaii cheered by fans during a performance Friday. Siwa'i has been to the parade before, but knew this year would be different. What do you think you'll be feeling? I think I'll be emotional. What are you feeling right now? For me, writing the music for the group and having these students who had challenges in their lives bring it back to me, you know, is something meaningful. The power of music, giving them a memory they'll never forget. Such a powerful story. We're really glad to highlight that group and best of luck to them. Still to come, strong earthquakes rocking Japan, reducing some buildings to absolute rubble. We'll have those details, plus other stories trending around the world. So stay tuned.
Welcome back. Let's take a quick look around the world. In news we touched on at the top of the show, Israel's Supreme Court struck down a law pushed by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. It was meant to limit the court's power over government decisions. Last year, the government's judicial overhaul plan sparked months of protests prior to the Hamas-Israel war. Both Russian President Vladimir Putin and Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky rang in the new year with national addresses today, albeit with very different messages. Zelensky mentioned the ongoing war 14 times and vowed a free Ukraine would prevail. Putin made only a passing reference to the war and never mentioned Ukraine by name. In a televised New Year's address of his own, China's president, Xi Jinping, said his country's reunification with Taiwan is inevitable. And it's that kind of assertiveness that concerns the U.S. and its allies. China has not ruled out using force to take back Taiwan. And Denmark's Queen Margrethe revealed she will be abdicating the throne after 52 years. And she made the announcement in this address on live television, shocking everyone. Her son, Crown Prince Frederick, will take her place later this month. Rescuers have been dispatched along Japan's west coast after a series of powerful earthquakes struck, killing several people. It happened off the coast of Ishikawa just about just after 4 p.m. local time. According to Japan's meteorological agency, the strongest quake measured a magnitude of 7.6, and it was so powerful, tremors could be felt all the way on the other side of the country in Tokyo. Pretty massive, if you ask me. Uh, so the whole room was shaking, the TV was shaking. It was just a violent shake, I mean violent shaking. The quakes left a considerable, a considerable amount of destruction behind, leveling some buildings, burying people under the rubble, knocking out power. A huge fire broke out in the city of Wajima. The city's hospital there says they're treating several people for disaster-related injuries. Tsunami warnings were in place for hours after the quakes, forcing thousands to seek higher ground. Thankfully, those warnings have since been downgraded. NBC News foreign correspondent Megan Fitzgerald has more. Good to be with you. Well, what we know is that this is one of the most significant earthquakes that the western part of Japan has seen in years. Major TV network in Japan, NTV, now reporting that three people have died, one of them dying after being trapped under the rubble. Uh, that continues to be a focus. As officials say, uh, there are multiple reports of people being trapped under collapsed buildings and homes. Roads have buckled and cracked, making them impassable. So the prime minister, who will personally head the nation's disaster relief, says supplies will now come in by boat because at this point, that's the only way to make it in. Uh, the military has been deployed to help as tens of thousands of people are now without power. Shelters have been put in place because temperatures in the region are near freezing. It is also important to note that officials have confirmed that the nuclear plants in the region have not seen any irregularities, but you can bet that they are keeping a close eye on that as well. Back to you. I'm sure. Megan Fitzgerald, thank you so much. Well, tonight the U.S. is facing off with China over illegal fishing. Now in an NBC News exclusive, Keir Simmons takes us along with the U.S. Coast Guard as it patrols off the coast of Peru. Tonight, closer to the U.S. coast than to China, a contest between superpowers on the high seas. Monitoring this massive Chinese fishing fleet looming off South America has become the U.S. Coast Guard's urgent focus. NBC News was invited to board the USCGC ALDA, its 50-strong crew, on a new mission. So there's nothing wrong with fishing. It's just you got to do it in a way that's responsible. They're part of a multinational law-enforcing effort aimed at curbing overfishing. It's a matter of national security. Because around 40% of the world gets at least some of their protein from fish. So that's why there's a sense of urgency here. China's huge fishing industry, with Chinese government subsidies, dominates the South Pacific Ocean, over 10,000 miles from home, fishing for giant squid. We take a flight with the Peruvian Navy, 200 miles off their coast. We're crossing into international waters right now to find a flotilla of Chinese squid jiggers just outside Peruvian territorial waters, relentlessly pursuing the squid. We've been flying for about 20 minutes at 2,000 feet. 
just above the ocean, and we've already seen 10, maybe more, Chinese fishing vessels. According to a report by Oceana, a Washington-based ocean conservation group first seen by NBC News, China's colossal distance water fleet is monopolizing the world's oceans. Some vessels allegedly turning off their tracking devices at times and fueling unregulated fishing practices in conservation and protected areas such as the Galapagos, as identified by NOAA. They are globally seen as one of if not one of the worst actors when it comes to legal, unreported and unregulated fishing. The report detailing hundreds of so-called factory ships carrying the huge hauls of squid home to China so smaller ships can keep fishing. They fished for about 134,000 hours, which is an astronomical amount. Still, she says, because the U.S. imported more than $686 million of seafood over the past five years, including from China, Congress has been able to apply pressure on Beijing by threatening to stop imports without improved fishing practices. Squid like this may end up on your dinner table in the U.S. We want to make sure that the squid that we are eating aren't the process, or aren't a part of illegal fishing. The Chinese embassy in Washington responding, telling us they should not be made responsible for the actions of a small number of vessels. Tonight, the US and China sharing the Pacific with many other nations while battling over its resources. Keir Simmons, NBC News, Peru. Before we go, new laws are taking effect in every single state this year. We'll tell you about some of them, including changes for drivers and even rules in one state for how stores display kids' toys. Stay tuned. Tonight in the future of everything, we're looking at new sets of laws that went into effect for 2024. NBC News' Ken Delanian has a closer look at some of the major changes. From the meaningful to the mundane, new laws are taking effect in every state. Here are some of the measures drawing attention as 2024 gets underway. After threats drove away half the state's top election officials, Nevada took action. Starting January 1st, those who harass, intimidate, or harm election workers performing their duties in the state could face up to four years in prison under a new law that unanimously passed the state legislature. Most people don't realize either that 80% of our election workers are women. Those are our daughters, those are our wives, those are our sisters, those are our mothers. A campaign promised by Secretary of State Francisco Aguilar, the law makes Nevada one of a handful of states where threats to election workers are a felony. We cannot run elections without people. They are our unsung heroes of democracy. In Tennessee, a new law toughens penalties for distracted driving. Those under 18 cited for a second offense could see their license suspended. The measure is named for a local businessman who died in a 2020 accident. If it's just one life we save a year by this law, then my dad would be an honor to have it in his name. California is requiring stores with more than 500 employees in the state to offer gender neutral toy sections. Failure to comply could result in fines. Why would it be such that a dinosaur or a truck or a periodic table would be in the boys' section or glitter or paint would be in the girls' section? Let's just fundamentally allow kids to be kids. You've seen all the criticism of this. Uh, one, one newspaper called it California's latest woke insanity. How do you respond to that? This bill was inspired by private sector, uh, following that of re major retailers, Target, and so many others are already going in this direction. This is a manufactured uh, controversy in saying that it is a, a potentially a, a woke government. In Louisiana, the state legislature overrode the governor's veto of a bill banning gender-affirming care for transgendered minors. The bill prohibits doctors from prescribing puberty blockers and hormone treatments. Critics say the new law won't survive a court challenge. It is my sincere belief that this bill is unconstitutional. I believe the courts will declare that in due course. Pennsylvania toughened penalties for drivers who failed to stop for flashing red lights on school buses. And Michigan is allowing 16-year-olds to pre-register to vote. With a presidential election looming in 2024, the Brennan Center think tank says at least 14 states have passed measures making it harder to vote, while 23 states have enacted laws making it easier. How these changes will affect the outcome is unclear.
All right, Ken Delanian for us. Thank you, Ken. Well, teens are quitting vaping, but not for health reasons. TikTok influencers started a trend encouraging followers to stop vaping to protest a kind of mining. NBC's Stephen Romo has more. A new trend on TikTok. I just want to tell you one more reason you should stop vaping. Encouraging people to stop vaping. But this time, it's not about their health. It's aimed at helping workers in the Democratic Republic of Congo's artisanal cobalt mines, smaller scale operations where the work is often done by hand. These mines have dangerous conditions and even child labor, according to humanitarian groups like Amnesty International. I'm quitting vaping. The reason it's still happening is because of how much we consume. TikTok creator Christina Narkai heard about what happens in these mines and says she was so outraged she had to do something. And he just kept saying, don't buy new electronics. And I'm like, I already do that. You know, what else can I do? And then I found just to quit vaping. Cobalt is a key element used to make lithium ion batteries, which much of our technology depends on. Things like smartphones, electric vehicles, and most e-cigarettes. I would buy a vape pretty much like once or twice a week. Two thirds of the world's cobalt supply comes from the Democratic Republic of the Congo in Central Africa. But most of that is then sent to China where it's refined before it's sold to battery manufacturers and then brand name companies buy those batteries. As brand name companies, they have a share of responsibility um, for the entire value chain and Clearly, if they make the ask for addressing um, human rights concerns in the cobalt supply chain, even as deep down as in artisanal mines, they can really help to drive change. Concerning because of the potential health risks that the mining process can bring. The cobalt dust has apparently very sharp edges and it can cut into your lungs and cause chronic respiratory diseases. But beyond that, it's the extraction method that brings most of the dangers. Those tunnels can collapse and bury people alive. The U.S. Department of Labor has also raised the alarm on DRC cobalt mining, saying children are often forced to work in, quote, terrible conditions. With lithium ion batteries powering more and more of our lives, the problem isn't likely going anywhere soon. But many taking part in this trend Hope the increased attention can lead to concrete changes, like formalizing the operation of smaller mines and requiring safety equipment. I think it's fantastic that um, these users are raising awareness that instead of just quitting the vaping, I would love for this campaign to make the concrete ask for the formalization of artisanal mining. Helping those who help make our 21st century technology possible. Stephen Romo, NBC News. Really interesting. Finally tonight, we're starting this new year with some good news about people sharing their hopes, optimism, and dreams for 2024. Take a look. When the clock struck 12 in Times Square, the flurry of confetti carried messages of hope for the year ahead. On the wishing wall. That's because all month long, visitors at New York City's wishing wall. I wish to have a good 2024. Put pen to paper. My wish is to get a full-time job out of college. Want to come make a wish with us? Write it on a piece of confetti. Each tiny piece, a big dream for a brighter future. My wish is for God to surround me with great people. My wish this year is for more health more love and more positivity. My wish is for my mom to have a blessed life. I wish for world peace. There were also hopes for healing. I wish for my brother's good health and his treatment to be very successful. Family, health and happiness. Three, two, one, happy new year! Adventure. My wish is to travel the world. And there were words of love for the little ones yet to come. This one reads, I wish for a healthy baby from your future dad. And I wish for a healthy baby boy in May 2024. In the year ahead, so many have their eyes on the prize. My wish is to be a Broadway star. It's to meet Taylor Swift. My wish is to break into the publishing industry. My wish for 2024 is to get into medical school. For others, connection is key. My wish for the new year is for peace, good health, and much love to New York City. I wish for a boyfriend. 
to fall more in love every day. I wish for happiness and love for my family in 2024. Millions of pieces of confetti swirling through the sky, a collection of dreams for all good things in the year ahead. I wish all of you a very healthy, happy new year. That's going to do it for tonight. I'm Kate Snow. We'll see you tomorrow, but until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.